We ask for guidance, we ask for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
They said, one more. There's a needle in it's in the valley, found it to be bright as the morning star. Girl, so there's a needle in the valley, oh, I said it's bright as the morning star. I said there's a needle in the valley, oh, I said it's bright as the morning star. Hallelujah, amen.
And I said, man, you already got me down this road. I'm, I'm going to stay with what I got. So at some point in this uh, lesson, I'm going to explain why Jesus wept. Okay, yes. All right? So, I'm going to read back. So, of course, I had to burn the midnight oil in order to come up with a lesson in time for this morning. So, y'all bear with me because I, I got no slow over the place. Yeah. All right? So, I'm, I'm going to read this text one, once again and bring it back into your remembrance. Now, I'm in John, the 11th chapter, beginning at verse number 1. Now, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and his sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair when his brother Lazarus was sick. So the sister sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, The sickness is not to the end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and his sister and Lazarus. So when he heard he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now, John's gospel is unlike the other synoptic gospels. John begins his gospel going all the way back into the beginning. He starts it off, in the beginning was the word, John 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the light was the light of men, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. As you progress, John's intent is to show and highlight some of the miracles that Jesus did in order to bring relief. So he has highlighted certain miracles. We are on the seventh miracle that Jesus did that John chose to highlight via the Holy Spirit. The first one occurred in chapter 2 when he made... He turned water into wine. I think this is an old joke that I heard back in the day. I, I, I'm going to tell you. All right? He said that, the community said, if you want, you want to know how you, you can prove Jesus was Bible? He said, the first miracle that he did was turn water into wine. The party was starting to, to, to you know, they were not alcohol, it was running low, and Jesus came on the scene, and he said, normally I don't do this, but just this one time, keep the party going. Yeah, that's all right. Forgive me, <laughs> but I just wanted to share, share that with you. Now, in chapter 4, he, he heals the official son. In chapter 5, we have two miracles, one of them feeding the 5,000 and also him walking on water. In chapter 9, we get to the point where he heals the blind man, the, the man that was born blind, he heals him. And now we arrive at John the 11th chapter and the raising of Lazarus. Now this is one of the climactic uh, miracles that he did because from this one miracle you had the greatest response. When I say greatest response, you had the most people placing faith in Christ. Right. Okay. It, and um, also it signed his death warrant because after this miracle, the opposition formed. Well, the opposition was always there, but they unite in an attempt to kill Jesus. All right. And as I said, this was the one with the greatest, let me go back, greatest impact. the greatest impact. It is not his last miracle. You know, John, like, as I said, he highlighted certain things to bring belief. And, and when you look at John 20 and 30, he said, many other signs truly that Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life through his name. And then at the last verse in chapter 21, he says, the world alone could not contain the books necessary to record all the acts that he did. Right. So he has highlighted these miracles and the Holy Spirit to, for those reading or those hearing it, it would produce belief in, in them. All right? So the, for the church, the last miracle he did would be Malchus. With, remember when Peter cut off the... Uh, high priest slave there when they came to God to get him, that would be the action actually out of the last miracle that he did. Now what you will see as a result of this uh, miracle, you will see increase in faith from his disciples. 
you will in, you'll see increase in faith, and I'm talking about the inner circle of his disciples, also increase in faith by Mary and Martha, and by the oncoming, oncoming crowd that came to support her and mourn with her at the funeral. So now, Jesus constantly wanted to support, to strengthen the faith of his uh, disciples. Now, certain questions have to arise because of uh, it's stated that I read that part. Let's see. Uh, okay, now in verse 5, it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and his sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he didn't stay two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. So, so some questions are asked, uh, being asked probably in the minds of his, his, his close disciples because they knew he had the power to heal from afar off. He had shown that. And he declared his love he, in the text that he, he loved Mary and Martha. So why did he allow, you know, this person to die that he was so fond and loved so much? And in the text it says, he asked in verse 4, he said, but when Jesus heard this, he said, the sickness is not to the end of death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. This miracle, as I said before, would bring glory to God, and it would signify that Jesus was his Son, and he had the power over death and the grave. Okay. Now, there's some danger involved. All right? Because after this, he had just left Judea. They attempted to stone him. It, was, it would be dangerous for him to return there. And that's what, that was in the mind of, of his disciples. You see Thomas saying, all right, Jesus, if you're determined to go back, then we might as well go with you. And that's in verse 16. And, and I, I'm ready to die with you. I don't know how sincere that was. Because Peter said basically the same thing. I live and die and will forsake you. And when the time came, it was... It, it, it didn't materialize. He couldn't keep his promise. So there's danger there. But Jesus is on the divine timetable. So he cannot be taken before the appointed time. We see constantly when he was in danger that his enemies could not take possession of him. And we have examples of that before the appointed time in John 11 and 7. Then after he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. You'll go. Okay, I'm sorry, wrong one. John 8 and 20. These words he spoke in the treasury as he thought in the temple that no one seized them because his hour had not yet come. In 7 and 30 of John, they were seeking to seize him, and no man laid hand on him because his hour had not yet come. John 13, 1, before the peace of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So there was no real danger because the appointed time had not arrived. Now his disciples are not aware of that. And as I said, uh, Thomas, he made that um, testimony. I don't know if he was sincere or not. Only time, we will we, we'll never know actually. But he said, I'm ready to die with you, Lord. Now, oftentimes in the body of Christ, and people have the perception that once I come to the Lord, that everything should be easy street. There shouldn't be any problems, there shouldn't be any obstacles that I encounter because now I'm a child of God. But God does not have a pampering love. He wants us to grow. And unfortunately, sometimes we only grow through our trials and through our tribulations. Right. All right? And Martha and um, Mary are going to grow from this trial and from this tribulation that they are experiencing. I know I didn't give you all the title. The title of the lesson is uh, Bring Glory to God. I have three points. Faith in difficult times. Point two, responding positive, positively to the ministry of the Word and the Spirit of God. And point three, the reveal power of God. Alright. Okay, so I, I just talked about that we all, we're not going to have a pampered life, you know, being in Christ Jesus. And that there are going to be some hard times, there are going to be some difficult times, but we have to 
grow from those difficult times. And it's not something that's automatic. It's something that you have to grow. You have to pray on and ask God for the strength to grow through these trials and come out ahead stronger than what you went into it. Amen. What we often do is fixate on the problem. And what I try to tell people is you always have to have some scriptures laid aside you know, for a rainy day, for, for, for a trial and for a storm that, that is coming on to you. Alright? Because if you don't, what you're going to do in our society, we are fixated, we get fixated on the problem and we want an instantaneous solution to the problem. And if we can't get an instantaneous solution, then we'll go to God in prayer and ask for help. But if you have some scriptures laid up, what it's going to do in this fast paced world, slow things down to the point where you can go to these scriptures. And what they're going to do is remind you of the promises that God has made to us. And by remembering those promises, things are being put back into perspective. You're able to slow things down. You'll be able to approach this the way God wants you to approach this on His timetable as opposed to yours. So, responding, I'm on point to responding positively to the ministry of the Word and the Spirit of God. Now, in verse 21, we read that of John 11. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe it? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, and even he who comes into the world. Now in 25, he says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. All right? And these are one of the, the, the great I am statements of Jesus. When he said I am, he's re revealing part of his godly character. All right? When he said I am the resurrection, he's letting them know I have power over death and the grave. All right? I am able to raise Lazarus. But as you see in the text, she doesn't understand that. First she states that in 22, that what, even I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. But she doesn't expect Jesus to raise Lazarus. She thinks it's a past thing, and she focuses now on the final resurrection when all will rise when Jesus returns. So she focuses on that, but he said, I am the resurrection. I have the power to raise him from the grave. And she doesn't understand that, but she does, she does have some faith, and she testifies that you are the Son of God, the Messiah. And I know she didn't get it, because when they get, finally get to the grave, and he says, remove the stone. She, she, she uh, has a voice of protest and says, listen, he's been in the grave four days. His body is going to have begun to stop. Hold, hold on for a minute. So I know she didn't understand. He's saying, right now and here, I have the power to raise Lazarus, but it went over her head. She didn't understand. Okay? So now, what we as Christians need to do when we study is, is learn how to put things in context, you know? Not, don't just read the scripture and make it become what you want it to become or say what you want it to say. Sometimes it takes a little bit more time to read maybe one or two chapters ahead, one or two chapters behind to get a context of what's going on. You want to know who, what, when, where, why. Those are the questions you should be asking so you can get an understanding of God's word. Because if you don't get an understanding of God's word, it will not be helpful unto you in your Christian walk. Because you have to see yourself in the text. One of two things is going to happen. Either you're going to see that you're in line with God's word and you continue, continue on giving God the glory, or you see that you're not in harmony with God's word and the change has to take, a play, take place. You have to ask God for the strength to make the change so you're in harmony with his word with his will. You don't want to read the text and it's talking directly to you and you don't see it, but you can look across the room and see, oh, that's talking about you. You know? So, so we, we have to be careful. We got we to spend a little bit more 
time in the text. There's many technical tools that we can use to help us get a better understanding so we don't take a text and run with it. So, so understanding and taking things in context is, is very important. So when someone says, I am, it reveals something, as I said, about their character. For, for example, if I say I'm a Christian, I'm making a big, bold statement that my identity is in Christ, and that is what is most important to me. So when Jesus says, I am, we should pay close attention. He has the power and the ability to raise Lazarus from the dead. Okay, I'm on, I'm on the third point now. The revealed power of God. Now let's go to John the 11th. Yes, yeah, still in John 11 and verse number 32. <laughs> Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see Jesus wept. All right, here we go. All right, so this is the shortest verse in the, in the Bible. It's also one of the deepest verses in the Bible. And what it's doing is showing Jesus' humanity. All right. Our Lord's Holy reveals the humanity of the Savior. He has entered into all of our experiences. The Bible said he was tempted at all points. Being tempted at all points but without sin. The Hebrew writer says because of what he suffered, because of being tempted at all points, it makes him sympathetic to all the trials and tribulations that we go through. He was without sin, and he, it qualifies him to be our high priest. He can stand there and tell our part. The Bible refers to him also as the advocate, meaning that he pleads our case when we fall short, and he's never lost the case. So he understands our, our, our trials, he understands our tribulation, and he is able to help us in times of need. Isaiah 53 and 3 said he was acquainted with our griefs. All right? So he understands what we go through. We see examples of it when, um, and what text was that? Um, in Matthew the 23rd chapter, when he looks over Jerusalem and he sees and knows what will happen. He knows that when the Ro in AD 70, when the Roman Empire comes and lays siege around Jerusalem, he sees all the death, he sees all the pain, all the agony that is going to occur because of that siege, the destruction of the, the temple and all the death that will follow, and he begins to weep. We're seeing the human side of God. He was God and man at the same time. In Isaiah, in Hebrews 5 and 7, we show him weeping again. Now the gospel doesn't have an account of this, but the Hebrew writer testifies in Hebrews the fifth chapter in verse 7, it says, In the days of his flesh, he offered up little prayers and supplication with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety. All right? So in the garden, with that great burden upon him, knowing exactly what was to come, all the pain, the agony, the suffering, the betrayal, it laid heavy on his shoulders. And, it's, and, and at this point, we see the Hebrew writer telling us that he shed tears. So he wept because he was being sympathetic with Mary, Martha, and those who had come to mourn him. We're seeing the human side of Jesus. In Romans 12 and 15, we're told to weep with those that weep and to rejoice with those that rejoice. So now, we arrive at the... Uh, at the grave site. And Jesus begins to do certain things so there will be no doubt that he is who he says he is and he has the power to raise Lazarus from the dead. So let's go to verse number 39. Well, let me back up a little bit. I'm starting to for And he said, where have you laid it? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man also from dying? So Jesus again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. 
Jesus said, Remove the stone, Martha. And the sister of the deceased said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been there four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of, of, glory of God? Now look how he, he goes about to ensure that everybody understands what's going on. So then they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. When they had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, saying, Lazarus, come forth. Now, he didn't have to use a loud voice because when he raised Jairus, he just, he just said it in his regular voice. But he is making sure that everybody there understands what's going on and proves that, that his power and what he's able to do. So the man who had died came forth bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. There were many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what had happened, believed in it. So Jesus, in, in his divine wisdom, did everything that was necessary to produce belief in the crowd, also understanding from the crowd. Now in the next chapter, some of the individuals here are at, when Jesus gets on the donkey and he comes into Jerusalem on the donkey, everybody's praising them. Some of the people that were here were also there testifying of Jesus and what he did. Also, some went to the uh, Sanhedrin, to the chief priests, and the Pharisees that they devised a council against Jesus because now you have a miracle that could not be denied, all right? Could not be disproved, all right? And Lazarus, there's no recorded act of what he said after this, but he was a constant testimony to God's glory every time he, he got out of bed, every time he walked down the street. He didn't have to say anything, you just saw him. And everybody knew who he was. And he was a thorn in the side to the opposition, you know. And I'm sure the desire to kill him, there's no record that they got to him, but I'm sure they wanted to eliminate the proof that, 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 um, of, of him coming from being uh, raised from the grave. So now, as I said earlier, there's a conspiracy to kill Jesus. So now, in verse 47, therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees conveyed a council and were saying, what are we doing? For this man is performing many signs, and if we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So you see that their motivation is materialistic. Now, my historian is right there, that's it. All right, and he will tell you that the way the Roman Empire worked is that they would go and they would count, count conquer a, a city, a country, whatever the case may be, and they would leave a military force behind, and they would leave a ruler in that, in that particular place, and they would give a certain amount of authority for the individuals to handle business among them. So they had a certain amount of authority, they couldn't do everything, and as long as they functioned, as long as they paid the taxes, then there was no problem. Once you had something that you weren't authorized for, you come to the ruler and he'll take care of it. If they got to the point where they wanted to rebel and they thought they could, and, and they were successful in taking down this, this person that was left behind and dealing with the army, well, here comes the Roman force, the Roman army in full force to take care of this problem and to set an example. Now, these individuals, the enemies of Jesus, now devise a council because they have to take care of this problem. They fear that what they have, the authority they have, the possessions they have, will all be lost because the Romans will then intervene because of his popularity and, 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 and take what they have. So it is nothing to do spiritually. It all has to do materialistically. They fear what they have and they fear losing it. But when you look at it, even in this, the midst of Jesus' enemy, he finds a way, I mean, God, God the Father finds a way to bring glory to him. Because as we read on in verse 49, the one of them, 
Sophias, who was the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it's expedient for you that one man died for the people, and that the whole nation not perish. Now he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together a one, the children of God, who were scattered abroad, abroad. So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. So here, in the midst of Jesus' enemy, God intervenes, uses the high priest to prophesy that Jesus would be the one to unite the nation in one. That was not his purpose to, to, to bring glory to Jesus. He wanted to hold on to what he had. He wanted to plan the fires to stop Jesus. But here God intervenes and uses him to prophesy about Jesus and him bring it all together in one. All right? So from that day on together, they plan to kill him. And the ironic thing is about it that all these things that they valued so much in AD 70, they would lose when that whole same Roman Empire surrounds Jerusalem and they put the siege on the city, they locked down everything. The result was that city got destroyed, that temple got destroyed, and whatever authority they had, whatever possessions they had, were all gone. Okay, they were all dispersed after that. So, we see God's hand in the midst of, it, of his enemies still bringing glory to it. Alright? Well, that's my lesson for you today. If, if there is uh, someone who wants to put on Christ in baptism, you come by hearing God's word, believing what he has said, repenting of your sins, confessing the sweetest name, knowing a man, and being baptized in water and prayer of baptism for the remission of sins. As together we stand and say.
have a prayer request here from Brother Paul Folsom, who has some prayer for my co-worker whose son is in intensive care at Memorial Hospital. We want to continue to keep that family in our prayers. I have a request here from my sister Zuri Edwards, who's asking for prayer as I relocate to Maryland in the next two weeks. I want to take this time to thank all of you for the love and support over the years. So we're going to continue to keep Sister Zuri in our prayers for her and making her new journey up in Maryland. I have a request here from my sister Nellie Dunbar, who has a prayer request at this time. She's home recovering under the weather at this time, asking for God and the church for prayers for a speedy recovery. We're going to continue to keep Sister Nellie Dunbar in our prayers. Every prayer request here from Sister Marlene Giles, who's asking prayer for her husband, and for her father, Fletcher Johnson, who resides in Flint Mill Hurley Hospital, and he's coming home today, hopefully. So we're going to continue to keep Sister Giles and her family in our prayers. Let's also continue to keep the families of Sister Hannah White and Josie Mosley in our prayers during this time of bereavement. Let's also continue to keep our brother Fred Hall and Sister Barbara Hall in prayer at this time. Let's also continue to pray for our sister Miranda Porter, who is home ill at this time as well. Also, brother and sister White are home ill. And let's also continue to remember our brother and sister, brother Hall, Horace Hall, and sister Daniel Hall. They're taking their son to Southwestern Christian College on this weekend, so let's continue to pray for them for traveling. Grace that they'll make it back there safely and back home to us once again safely. Amen. So at this time, let's go to Heavenly Father and pray for all of these individuals. Our dear, kind, merciful Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we come before you at this time, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, Heavenly Father, and thanking you for your mercy. Heavenly Father, thanking you, Heavenly Father, for just this opportunity to come out this morning to worship you with spirit and in truth. Heavenly Father, we come before you at this time and ask you for many requests that were made. For those who are sick at this time, Heavenly Father, we ask that you just put your loving hands of grace and mercy upon those individuals. Heavenly Father, strengthen them, Heavenly Father. Provide them that source of comfort and strength that only you can provide, Heavenly Father. Allow them to get off the sick bed, Heavenly Father, and come back to us, Lord. Worship with us once again in spirit and in truth. Heavenly Father, for those who are traveling, Heavenly Father, we ask that you give them all traveling grace. Heavenly Father, we ask that you to bless each and every one of them, Heavenly Father, that they will make this nation, Lord, safe and Lord, return to us, Lord, without any hurt, harm, or danger. Heavenly Father, for those families, Lord, going through bereavement at this time, Heavenly Father, we ask that you just put your loving arms of grace and mercy upon them. Heavenly Father, provide them, Lord, that source of comfort and strength, Heavenly Father. And Heavenly Father, be with those families, Heavenly Father. Let them understand, Heavenly Father, that even though they're going through this particular difficult time, they have a just God to lean upon, Heavenly Father. And no matter what they go through, Heavenly Father, if it is your will, you will always lead them safely through. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the man of God, Lord, Brother Regan, and his message on today. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for allowing him, Lord, to stand in your stead, Heavenly Father, and preach your holy and divine word, Heavenly Father. Continue to be with him and his family, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, bless this congregation as a whole, Heavenly Father, as we continue to grow together, Lord, in love and unity, Lord, doing those things, pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Heavenly Father, bless us, Lord, as we in our communities, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, hopefully bringing others closer to you, Heavenly Father, as does you should have us to do. Heavenly Father, we ask you to continue to bless all of those in our military, Heavenly Father, and continue to bless all of our world leaders as well, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we ask you to continue to bless us, Lord, guide us, and protect us through all the many endeavors we go through in our daily walk with thee. It is in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Let us all together say, Amen. Amen. Of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be 
guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and also let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he who eateth and drinketh in an unworthy manner, eateth and drinketh down judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So we give thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, once again, we are so to be thankful. God is here with us, Heavenly Father, in the mental, most of all, in the spiritual, Heavenly Father. We thank you for this Son, Jesus Christ, who has shed his blood, and we are so to be thankful for the bread of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
and I say it's a nice announcement for last. I have a nice good announcement here. Our own sister Carolyn Bush has wrote a book. Amen. 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 And the title of the book that she wrote is called God, Mom, and Me, Our Family, Faith, and Fight. So you can order it on Amazon. Amen. So Sister Bush, amen. We do appreciate that. So let's support Sister Bush. Amen. Let's look for her book online. And if you want to know any more about Sister Bush, about Sister Books Bush, please see Sister Bush after service and she will give you more information about that. Amen. So let's go ahead and support that at this time. So that is going to be all of our announcements on today. I don't know, Philip, I know you kind of, but can you give us just one more song before we dismiss? Mm -hmm. And then Brother Paul is going to give us our dismissal prayer. Let the Spirit of the Lord say rise among us. Let the Spirit of the Lord say just rise among us. Let the praises of our King let it rise among us. Let it rise. We say, oh. Thank you for allowing us to come together and fellowship and hear a portion.